Okay, guys, so this is topic 29, the atom, the nucleus, and radioactivity. So it's the second topic in modern physics, or nuclear physics, as some people like to call it. Um, so after this, we will only have two more to do, one kind of compulsory topic, and then the last topic, practical physics, which is the option question. Okay, so this topic here is pretty much very, very theory-heavy, and pretty much all theory. Um, so if you're kind of into theory and that's your kind of favorite thing is theory and you kind of prefer that over the maths kind of side of things you might enjoy this topic whereas myself personally I'm much more maths uh, orientated so this topic kind of irritates me a little bit <laughs> just because I hate mass amounts of theory and reading okay so the gold foil experiment so the first thing here guys is what exactly happened Okay, so they sometimes can ask about this in the exams, but it's important to know anyway, how did they do this? How did they discover these things? So if I remember correctly, there was, um, the original theory was that um, the atom was like, how do you call it? Like a cookie, if you will, where the protons and the electrons were kind of in a solid structure. Okay, and it took a long time before they got the Niels Bohr model, where they realized that there was actually a, a central nucleus and then the electrons orbiting out the outside and then of course it turns out the Niels Bohr model was too simplistic that there isn't actually there is orbits but it's more like an electron cloud but that's that's way too complicated it's a lot easier to try and understand the the orbit structure um, while it's incorrect it is pretty good to get the idea across to what exactly happens okay so what they did with this test is they fired alpha particles at gold foil okay so if the the um, the cookie structure if you will was correct okay or as i don't hear the plum pudding that's what it was sorry plum pudding interpretation was correct then all of the particles would have struck the gold leaf and then bounced back off okay so we're off to a good start with the pen not working brilliant i have ordered a new one and i have no idea where it is lost in the mail probably um so that's what should have happened okay so if this was the the plum pudding everything would have bounced back. But instead, that's not what happened. Instead, some particles, most particles, went straight through. Some particles deflected off at angles, and other particles got completely bounced back. Okay? So this, at the time, changed everything. All right? So if the plum pudding was correct, everything, absolutely everything, should hit that gold foil and bounce back. But instead, they went through it. Some bounced off at angles, and others hit the gold foil and bounced back. Okay? So what did that get them to think? And this is the, the thing about physics, or about all sciences, really. Okay, it's why, um, especially in this day and age now, with um, conspiracy theories flying around, um, how science is meant to work is you have an idea, you test the idea, and whatever the result is, that's it. That's the reality of it. And then everybody else will come up and test your idea. Okay, and if your idea can hold up against all the tests, then your idea is taken as fact. Okay, so the plump pudding idea was taken as fact, not because obviously they didn't have technology to test it. So then eventually they did. They decided, now we can test it. We can fire alpha particles at this. If you're correct, everything should bounce back. It didn't. It went through. They detected it. So now they had to come up with, well, why did that happen? So they have to come up with an explanation. So why is it that this happened, not that? Okay? So why is it that some things went through, others didn't, instead of everything coming back? Okay? So they came up with the next stage. Okay? They realized that what must happen is that the atoms must be mostly empty space with a solid center, okay? And the electrons orbit around the outside, okay? Now, the reason they had the electrons orbiting around the outside is because the electrons, obviously, are negatively charged, okay? And they would move. They'd move, hence why we get electricity. And the nucleus never really moves, so they obviously had to piece that together. So you have the nucleus in the center, which is positive, the electron in the outer shell, which is negative, and the electron is drawn to the neutron, or it's already the proton, not the neutron, and the proton is attracted to the electron, and thus you get your, your atom. And what you see here is kind of what happened. So as you can see, most of the red lines are going straight through, because it's mostly empty space. Chances are they're going to go through. One or two, like for example here, strike the nucleus and that makes it deflect off and then others strike the nucleus head on and bounce straight back okay they go off they repel and bounce straight back okay so while most things will go straight through others will actually get deflected back okay or deflected off at an angle and that's what kind of happens okay so 
the nucleus. It's incredibly small. So the radius of a nucleus is 10 to the minus 15. So what that means is you divide a number by 10, 15 times. Okay, that's how small it is. Okay? And it's mostly empty space. So technically, you are mostly empty space. So the next time somebody tells you you're a waste of space, tell them technically, no, I'm made of atoms and they are mostly empty space. And then you get kicked out of the house for being a smart ass. Yeah, but it's the risks we take. So the emission spectrum, let me see now. So for this, if sufficient energy is supplied to the atoms of a solid liquid of gas, they would give out light. Yeah, okay, so they might ask you, what is this about? So basically, if we give things energy, i.e. heat or electricity, that's the way to think of it. Energy, think of energy as electricity, heat, they're the most common type, heat being the most common type, okay? But if we give certain solids, liquids, gases, energy, they'll generate light, okay? Hence why we have now energy efficient bulbs, okay? So the energy may be supplied, we go, by heating or electric current, for example, filament bulbs, all right? Uh, what we can do is when we get that light, if you pass that through a diffraction grating or prisms, okay, you'll get the rainbow effect, if you remember. Okay, uh, what we will look at, you get a spectrum. So we're gonna look at the continuous spectrum and the line spectrum. Now for humans, we can only see uh, a certain amount of colors because we've only got three corns, cor corns sorry, in our eyes. Okay, I pronounced that wrong. Don't tell your biology teacher. Um, but cones, that's the word, sorry, I said corns. Yeah, anyway, um, coronavirus, maybe it has affected me. Uh, so the... Continuous spectrum that we see is a mixture from the red all the way to violet. So in American books, they don't go indigo violet, they just go purple. Um, and I can see why all I can see is purple, but no, they're indigo and violet, they're, they, are, they are different. Okay, so you, we do have to say indigo and violet. So we have, that's our color spectrum. Every color you see is a combination of these. Now, I think there is a link in there's a link I have in the waves topic notes um, where they demonstrate this and what it is, it's on uh, the website PHET, FET. And if you go to the wave section, it shows the humans with, we basically have the, the, the uh, red, uh, was it red, yellow, yeah, um, and green. And what it is, is that our color corns go from these trees, so we've cones, and what they do is the tree cones hit our eyes at different. So what did I say? So yellow. No, it's not yellow. The, the primary color. Sorry, apologies. Not yellow. Um. So they hit our not green. Um. So they hit our our cones, and what they do is we see all the different variations then of the colors. So all these colors you see here, okay, they're basically from our tree primary colors all the way back in waves. I'm gonna have to go back over that because I'm obviously I'm gonna have to get all myself all confused now. Um, yeah, on that topic. Um, it is fairly here when I'm recording. I should probably record these later in the evening when I'm a little bit more awake. Uh, so the line spectrum. So basically what the line spectrum is, is the atoms, okay, of certain gases will give off colored light, okay? And again, if we pass them through the spectrum, we won't get the continuous spectrum like that. We get a line spectrum like this, okay? So carbon is the one here and hydrogen is up there. So this is kind of handy for a lot of scientists to determine what type of gas it is really. They can give it through the line spectrum, okay? Um, will you really ask for that? It's important to know the difference between the continuous and the line spectrum, okay? So continuous, the big thing being, continuous is usually solids and liquids and your line spectrum, where is it? There, is gases, okay? That's kind of the, the real thing to kind of remember. Okay, so the Bohr model. Uh, so what we did in the Bohr model, if you remember back to junior or science, uh, chemistry, junior or chemistry, um, you kind of covered the Bohr model and the, the idea of the orbits and stuff like that. Now we don't go into too much detail here in modern physics, but you do need to know um, the basic structure and some basic things to be able to explain it, all right? So for example, uh, electrons could only inhibit certain discrete levels, okay? If they get enough energy, they will jump to a higher orbit, this is, of course, unstable, and they will eventually fall back down. And when they fall back down, they'll emit electromagnetic radiation. Okay? So the electron, I think actually I have a diagram here. So the electron here, if you see, it's down in level one. And that shouldn't be 
it should be energy three because that's actually the third level out. Anyway, so it's orbiting, it gets energy, so we bring energy in. Okay. And this electron jumps up. Okay. So once the electron jumps up to a higher form, okay, all right, so it, it jumps up, it is of course unstable, and therefore when it's unstable, it drops back down, as you can see here, it drops back down, and then all the electromagnetic energy gets released, okay? So all the electromagnetic energy gets released. Now, the energy of an electron, okay, is they're each at an energy level, okay? So usually E1, E2, E3, okay? Now, when it gets out, they often call it, I call it unstable, but it's the excited state. So it's in an excited state. It's got a lot of energy it's shaking, you know, it's shaking with excitement. Um, however, eventually, um, it gets to see, it gets, it gets to see, sorry. Um, it, it releases the energy, it falls back down, okay? And we can actually calculate this, okay? We can calculate the amount of energy given out. If you remember back, E equals HF, Planck's constant. You see, that's where this equation comes from here. All right, and it's basically, the higher number minus a smaller number. So it's always the higher level minus a smaller level. Okay? So the higher level minus a smaller level to get the energy level emitted. Okay? All right. So two questions here. 2008. Uh, so high level, sorry, high energy radiation of frequency... 3.3, all right, so again, everything on the left-hand side, F equals 3.3 .3 by 10 to the fourth, to the fourth, okay, it's a fantastic, to the 14 um, hertz. Uh, what is the energy of the photon? So, energy of a photon is, Log tables, E equals H, F. H, H is the Planck's constant, which is in the log tables. So we multiply H by 3.3 by 10 to the 14, and we should get 2.18658 by 10 to the minus 19. And SI unit is joules, okay? Don't forget the SI unit. Again, you will not get marks for giving the SI unit, but if you don't give the SI unit, they will take a mark off, all right? So always list the values on the left-hand side, list your equation, and then do the maths. All right, so what is the wavelength in nanometers of a photon of energy 2.2 electron volts? Okay, so first things first, what do we need to do here? We need to convert that to joules, don't we? Yeah, can you remember how we do that? Okay, so dramatic pause. So if you look to your log tables, as I always say, log tables, learn how to use them, then make your life a lot easier. So in your log tables, we have one electron volt equals 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19 joules. So if one electron volt equals 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19, what does 2.2 electron volts equal? 2.2 by 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19. And there you go, okay? So, does that make sense, okay? So for a lot of these things, guys, um, hold on one second now. So for a lot of these, you, it is important to try and remember to use your log tables, okay? I know the habit is when you're answering questions at home and you're answering questions, that it's kind of use the notes, use the book. Um, and I always say, don't do that. And the reason I say don't do that is because in the exam, you will not have my notes. You will not have the book. You will have log tables, okay? Okay. So structure of the nucleus. And actually, something's irritating me now. I've got to go back. I'm going to go back here. All right. So, yeah. Red, blue, and green. Okay. So, 
as I said earlier, I got mixed up. I said red, yellow, green, and I just realised um, I never actually clarified what I was what I meant to say. Uh, so it's not red, yellow, green. I don't know why I said red, yellow, green. Our primary colours are red, green, and blue. Okay, and our secondary colours then. Okay, uh, our secondary colours are yellow, cyan, and magenta. All right. So if you go to the FET website, you'll see that where they show the three cones. Um, I just had to go back there when I could because it was. It was irritating me that um, I said yellow, and I don't think I corrected myself, so I just wanted to correct that there. Okay? All right. Um, yeah, so it's okay for me to make these kind of mistakes, guys, because uh, I'm not doing my exam. <laughs> but no, it's not. Um, no, so look, let's see, uh, I have an awful, as you all know, guys, trying to remember things. I find it very difficult, as a lot of you do. There's a lot to take in. So try and make it easier on yourselves. So with the, the line spectrum there, the color one, Try and always think, um, okay, Where, where's my marker? Okay, red, obviously, we're always going to see, okay? Blue, obviously, okay, is what we always see as well. So they're too common. And what a lot of people get mixed up, and I often do too, I get mixed up with yellow and green, okay? Because everyone said from a young age, if you mix yellow and blue, you get green, okay? But you have to try and remember that it's green, all right? Simply because if you mix... Uh, red and yellow, you get white. No, sorry, you don't get white. If you mix red and yellow, you get... That'll be mixing red, green. I don't know, you get some weird color color combination. You'd have to mix uh, red, green, and blue together to get white. Okay? So that's kind of it. The, it's an awkward one. That's a bit of a revision for waves for you. Um, anyway, back on topic. I'll be doing one on wave nature of light anyway, uh, later. Okay. Back to this. So the structure of the nucleus. Uh, I'm going to fire through this. You should really know the structure of the nucleus by now. Protons are positive, electrons are negative. So the atomic number, here we go. So the atomic number, what is it? The atomic number of an element is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom of that element. What is the mass number? It's the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. Okay. The mass number is given the letter A. And the atomic number is given the letter Z. Okay? So the mass number goes on top. The atomic number goes on the bottom. In chemistry and in the log tables, it's the other way around. So why did physics do it this way? Because if we made physics easy, everyone would want to do it. So your mass number, easy way to think of it, guys, the mass number is the bigger of the two numbers. Why? Because the mass number is the atomic number uh, plus the neutrons. Okay, so it's always going to be bigger than the atomic number. So the bigger the number is the mass number. Okay, now you can get the log tables for all of these values. Usually they're given to you, but if not, you go to the log tables and they have all of them. All right, so from again, this is all juniors or science, guys. Number of neutrons is the mass number divided by the atomic number. Number of electrons is, number of electrons is the atomic number. Number of protons is the atomic number. Now, realistically, the atomic number, me usually, if it's a, if it's a neutral, um, it's going to be the number of protons and electrons, but if it's not neutral, in other words, an electron could have gone or come in, then the atomic number is different, okay? All right. Uh, radioactivity. This is an important definition you need to know. It is the breakup of unstable nuclei with the emission of one or more types of radiation, okay? It's the Beckwell. I apologize. I've been pronouncing it wrong since the day I started physics, but nobody's corrected me yet, so... Uh, so what do we use radiation for? Many things, um, carbon dating, smoke alarms, literally if they ask guys, um, we use it for cancer treatment, we use it for lots of things, okay? All right, radiation, oh sorry, that was, oh, apologies, no, uh, I misread that, it's not radiation, it's artificial radioisotopes, okay? Uh, yeah, so agriculture, I don't know how they use it in agriculture, Food irrigation, radiocarbon and all these things. Okay, so there's many, there's many. Okay, you don't. There's there's actually more than just those six. You can pick any of the six. Okay. Uh, radiation from the nucleus. Okay, so unstable nuclei. They can become stable. They get rid of any excess energy. Okay. How to do this? Is radioactive decay. Now I'm going to call it radioactive decay, or you can call it radioactive disintegration. You want to mean the same thing, all right? There are three types of radiation that are going to be emitted. You have the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. 
Okay, so you have the alpha radiation, the beta radiation, and the gamma radiation. All right? They're the three types. What you need to know, you need to know which is the strongest, okay? The most, pen and by strongest, the, large, uh, the, the greatest penetrating ability, okay? Which um, has the greatest range and all that, okay? That's basically, and then you have to be able to show how to test that. And that's what we're going to go through here, okay? So, in an electric field, all right, gamma radiation is unaffected. It just passes straight through. Beta gets pulled towards the positive plate. Alpha gets pulled towards the negative plate. So if beta gets pulled towards the negative plate, what does that mean? Or it pulls towards the positive plate. What do we say about particles? Opposites attract. So if beta goes to the positive, that means beta must be negative and alpha must be positive. Okay? So beta, we later find out, is actually an electron. Okay? An alpha particle is H E four two. Okay. The beta and the alpha, of course, are oppositely charged, so they go in opposite directions. All right, in the magnetic field then, gamma, once again, goes straight through. Alpha behaves like a positively charged particle. Beta behaves like a negatively charged particle. But note, they go completely opposite directions to each other, okay? While gamma is unaffected. So gamma is unaffected in everything. It just goes straight through, okay? And lastly, penetrating ability. So the alpha particle gets stopped by a sheet of paper. The beta particles and the gamma will get through. However, when they hit a sheet of aluminum, the beta particle will stop. Gamma will keep going until it hits concrete of about a meter thick or lead. Okay? So in nuclear, in the Chernobyl, the, the, the problem wasn't really so much alpha and beta. It was the gamma rays. Now, alpha and beta are still deadly. Okay? Uh, alpha particles can kill you, but they have to get into your body. And that's the, that's the thing. So usually they come in through ingestion. All right? Same with beta rays. All right? Um, there was a... Famous case in England where a Russian spy, you probably don't remember this, got killed. It was not too long ago, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, got killed in a London restaurant by the, the Russians basically slipped, I think it was alpha particle, into, into his food. So he ingested it and it, it killed him. Okay? So it can actually kill you. So it is weak. It won't get into you, but if you ingest it, you're in serious trouble. Okay? And that's basically it. All right? What is ionization? Again, junior third science, when an atom loses or gains an electron, it becomes ionized. What is an ion? It's a charged atom, either positively or negatively charged. Okay? Now, a key thing here that we have to prove, okay? Oh, actually, it's coming up, all right? Um, I'll come back to this here now in a second, um, this bit, because I want to talk about something else first. I'll come back to that, all right? So, guy, girl, mother, choose. All right, or a GM tube is what it's called, all right? So this is basically what this kind of circuitry looks like. Now, they won't ask you to really draw, but they could ask you, how does it work, okay? And that's what these, these four steps here, about five steps, sorry. So radiation enters through a window. It causes ionization of the rare uh, gas molecules. These, now negatively charged, fire towards the anode, okay? And as they go, they ionize other particles. Then they all react to the anode and give a detected as a pulse. Okay, um, and then of course you get the tick. So in 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 the, again, I keep referencing the TV show Chernobyl. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's a great show. But there's a few things they do in it, like when they're checking for radiation. Okay, you can hear the click and click, 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 click. That's what it is. Okay, each time the charged ions hit the anode, you get the click. Okay, and obviously the more clicks there, and that means there's more charged ions coming in there, which of course then means more radiation. Okay. So I have two things here. There's two ways they can ask you how to do this. Either how would you test the radiation speed or how would you identify three different sources? This is very easy. Step one, get the background radiation count. The reason you need this is to prove, okay? So for example, there is radiation all around us, okay? Natural radiation, but it's in very low levels. So you need to find out what it is, okay? Uh, you set the counter to zero without any radiation sources nearby and then record the number of counts over a five minute period, okay? All right. You count the number of counts per second. Then you put the alpha particle in front of it, found the, uh, the ray, okay? Then slowly start walking back, 
okay, until it gets back down to zero and then repeat for beta and gamma. You can do the same thing with paper. You can put alpha down, put a sheet of paper down, see does it go to zero, then do beta, sheet of paper, no, tinfoil, yes, gamma, well, <laughs> you, you won't have gamma radiation. Um, or at least you shouldn't have gamma radiation in your classroom. You've other problems if you have gamma radiation. But if you did do this, you would find out that gamma radiation gets detected at the greatest source from the detector. It has the greatest range, okay, out of all of them. So alpha is the weakest, beta is the second, gamma is the strongest, okay? So if someone ever tells you they're an alpha male, um, they're the weakest of the bunch, all right? You want to be a gamma male. All right, so we could have tested penetrability. Yes, I just said that, right? So here, to demonstrate the ionizing effect of radioactivity, okay? Let's go and pop back up here for a second, all right? So what we can discover is that nuclear reaction was found to cause charged electrons to lose its charge, electroscope, okay? So the ions will charge anything that they pass through, all right? So if they go through, the alpha particles move through, all right? The electroscope will take those particles because they're going to appear positive, okay? Uh, whereas the beta particles will slow it down because beta particles, of course, are... Um, are negatively charged as well. So that's going to slow down the ability of that to collapse the leaves. Whereas gamma, of course, has no effect. So how do we demonstrate this? Very straightforward. Draw your simple diagram. So all we do, bring the radioactive source close to the cap. Okay, they collapse. There you go, that's it. Okay, watch your conclusion. The goalie of electroscope became neutralized by the ion air, ionized air. So we bring a radioactive source. You have a goalie of electroscope, you have a charge, the leaves separate, you bring the... Uh, the radiation source to it, the leaves collapse, you've proven it, done. Okay? All right. The effects of ionizing radiation depends on, yeah, it is kind of fairly self-explanatory, guys. So basically, three factors that will affect the impact of radiation on you, well, what type of radiation it is, um, how long you were exposed, the type of skin. So for example, if alpha particles get on your skin, you wash it off, deep wash it off, you're probably okay. However, if alpha particles get inside your mouth, you're, well, you coronavirus won't be your only problem, etc. All right. So what we're going to do now, this all leads into more important stuff. So that's kind of a lot of the theory out of the way. We're kind of finally getting into the, the max part. So we're getting to the interesting stuff, lads. Uh, so alpha particles, what are they? They are basically a helium nucleus, okay? Two protons, two neutrons, okay? So when an alpha particle is emitted, all right, you take four from the mass number, so four in the mass number goes, and it loses two protons, so two of the atomic number goes, all right? So with all these things, when things break down, all right, left-hand side equals right-hand side. That's the key thing here. So this, if you remember this back, again, units are chemistry, okay? Now, if the left-hand side doesn't equal the right-hand side, let's say mass disappears, well, then... You've, you've released nuclear energy, okay? We, and we'll get to that in the next topic, okay? So this is kind of setting us up. We're slowly getting to that, okay? So we have here radium. Radium emits an alpha particle, all right? So radium has an atomic number of 88 and a mass number of 226. Alpha particle has a mass number of 4, atomic number of 2. So 88 minus 2 gives us 86, and 266 minus 4 gives us 222. So that's what happens. That's what I mean by it takes. So the alpha particle is emitted. So our new substance here is radon. So radium gets broken down to radon. Okay? So how we usually do this, guys, is the mass number on the left-hand side must equal the mass number on the right-hand side. The atomic number on the left side must equal the atomic number on the right-hand side. Okay? So they have to always equal each other. Checking the notes there. Okay, we are still not even halfway there, guys. So this is this is a long topic. It's gonna to be a long video. You don't have to watch the whole video in one go, guys. You can't pause it. What are beta particles? Beta particles are, as I said earlier, they are electrons. Okay? They are electrons emitted. All right. So when they jump out, you just simply they don't affect the mass number, okay? They do change the atomic number. All right. So the mass number doesn't change with an electron, but the atomic number does. All right, it drops the atomic number down. Okay. Gamma high frequency, oh, and actually here, for gamma, what is a gamma radiation? It's a high frequency electromagnetic radiation emitted from the nucleus of a reactive atom, okay? 
So what happens with this? Why doesn't anything change? Okay, the structure remains the same. Okay, but the nucleus does lose energy and becomes stable. Okay. So these things are very unstable. By releasing gamma radiation, they release that excess energy. The electrons go back down to their original um, orbit, and the atom basically becomes um, a lot more stable. I was about to say a lot calmer, but that doesn't make sense. A lot more stable. Okay. All right, so we'll, let's just summary. We'll answer these few questions here. All right, so how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are there in a neutral atom of each of the following? Okay, so this is, this is just unit of revision, guys. Okay, so 1, 1, H means 1 electron, 1 proton, 0 neutron. How am I getting 0 neutrons? 1 minus 1 is 0. 4, 2, He means 2 electrons, 2 protons, 4 minus 2 equals 2 neutrons. Okay? So the atomic number, the number at the bottom here, is the number of protons and electrons. To get the atomic number, or the, the neutrons, you subtract the mass number from it. Uh, carbon is 12, 6 carbon, so that's 6E, 6P, and 6N, 12 minus 6, okay? All right, fairly straightforward. All right, now, this is more like it. So calculate the number of alpha particles, the number of beta particles emitted in the K of, all right, so what we have is we have 2, 3, 8, 92 uranium drops to R A two two six eight eight. So the first thing we need to do the change in the mass number. So we're gonna look for the mass. So it's two three eight minus two two six six eight two twelve. Okay, so the change in mass was twelve. Okay, now, each alpha particle is 4, 2, so their mass is 4, so 12 divided by 4 equals 3. So there are 3 alpha particles here, so we simply add that in. Oh, 3, 4, 2, H, E. Okay? So now that adds up. 226 plus 12 equals 238. So the mass numbers are correct. So now we gotta look at the atomic numbers. So the atomic then, so. A equals 92 plus 88, okay, plus uh, six. Oh, sorry, no, ah, not 92 plus, apologies. 92 equals 88 plus 6. Uh, 88 plus 6 does not equal 92, okay? All right, so we're kind of in a problem here. We've got 94, okay? So we've got 94. So how do we get that back down to 92? Simple. We have to take two beta particles off. You see, beta is an electron, which as we said, is zero minus one E. So two of them should do it. Plus two, zero minus one E. So, two to six plus 12 plus zero equals 238. 92 plus 88 plus six minus two equals 92. All right, so top line equals bottom line, we're done. So what we have here is, all right, so 226 or a, 88, eight, plus three times, uh, three alpha particles and two beta particles is emitted. And that's it, that's all you do. Always start with the mass number. Go to the mass number, find out the mass number, that'll give you the number of um, alpha particles. Then once you've that done, add up all the atomic numbers. If they're fine, you're done. If not, bring in the alpha or the beta particles to get it in line, and that's it. Okay, 
Problem five. A radioactive nucleus emits four alpha particles, three beta particles. How much does this atomic number and mass number change? Okay, that's fine. So an alpha particle is four, two, H, E. A beta particle is zero, minus one. So there's four hydrogen. So we'll start with the mass. That's going to be four times four plus four times zero, which equals 16. And the atomic equals four times two plus four times minus two. Oh, I made a mistake there, apologies. I was gonna say there's no change in the mass of uh, the atomic, so it's three alpha particles. There we go, so three alpha particles. So four times two plus three times minus two gives us eight minus six yeah, equals two. Oh, what am I doing? Hold on a minute there now. Yeah. Does anyone else see the mistake I made? I was wondering if that didn't make sense. I don't know where I got two from. It's minus one. So it's that's my alpha. That's my beta. That's my alpha. That's my beta. So I was getting confused there. I was for some reason I was putting in the um the alpha twice. Okay, so don't do that. So the beta particle does not change. The atomic number or the mass number, but it will change the atomic number. So eight minus three. There we go. That makes more sense. And that becomes five. Okay. So mass changes by five. Not by five. By sixteen. Atomic changes by five. Okay. So these questions, guys. Um, they are fairly straightforward, but you can make mistakes like I did there. Uh, you do have to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and don't get confused. I, for some reason, I wrote down four twice, and then I put down the wrong value for, I put on minus two because I was looking at the alpha particle being two, and it just kind of brain fog moment. Okay, but there you go. All right, so we are a little bit over halfway. Okay, so let me see. All right, so from here on out, it's going to get very, very maths uh, intensive, okay? So I've only got three pages of theory, and then it's pretty much math from there to the end, all right? So if you wish, you can pause the video now, but I'm going to just keep going. So the activity of a radioactive nucleus, what is the activity? Okay, activity, where's my highlighter? Is the number of disintegrations occurring per second, okay? So one Beckwell is one disintegration per second. All right, what is the law of radioactive decay? Law is the number of nuclei decaying per second is directly proportional to the number of nuclei undecayed. All right, in other words, rate of decay is lambda times n. All right, so the rate of decay per second is directly proportional to the number of nuclei under the under undecayed, not under decayed, undecayed. Okay, so n, okay is the number of nuclei, so lambda is our constant here. This is our constant, okay? It is different for each type of radioactive isotope, okay? But it is constant for that isotope, okay? All right, so that doesn't change, okay? All right, okay. So, what is the half-life? And that's in the log tables, you don't need to learn it off. So what is the half-life? So basically, generally what happens is, guys, that uh, radiation it reaches a certain point when its radioactivity divides by half, okay? So the reason Chernobyl is a problem is that they used um, radiation, long-term radiation in nuclear power plants, which means the half-life is thousands of years, okay? Hence why nobody will live there for a lot long, you know, will be long gone before anyone, anyone moves back there, okay? Whereas the, the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in, in Japan, they're not as bad anymore. The reason being is the half-life for nuclear weapons is a lot shorter. It's only, um, I think it's a couple of weeks, I think, and the half-life kicks in. 
Okay, the reason being is they're not designed, they're designed for mass destruction, whereas the ones in nuclear power plants are designed for energy release. Okay. That's kind of an oversimplified version of that, okay? Um, but that's generally the reason. So half-life, there are two definitions you can go with. Uh, what is the half-life? The half-life of an element is the time taken for half the nuclei in the sample to decay. Or the half-life of an element is the time taken for the activity of a sample to decrease to half the original value. I personally think the first one is easier. Time taken for half the nuclei to decay, but each to their own, okay? All right, since the rate of decay uh, is lambda equals n. If n is half, all right, so basically here, this is why the two are in put together. If n is half in a given time, the value of the rate of decay is also half in this time. Okay? So in other words, the number of atoms disintegrating per second decreases by half. So if the half-life happens, the number of disintegrations happening per second also goes down because the rate of decay is proportional to n. Well, if n drops down by half its value, then the rate of decay drops down by half its value. Okay, so that's why it's all interlinked, okay? All right, so this is kind of what you get. It's kind of your graph here, okay, where you have 200. Now, if you've got a graph like this in the exam, they say, what's the half-life, okay? How you would do it is you look at the start number, which is 200, and you go to where there's half, 100, you see? And then you go to the next one, 50, and the next one, 2.25, and 12.5, and all the way down, okay? You never actually get to zero, okay? If you keep put, dividing something by two, it'll never get to zero, okay? Uh, it'll just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, all right? So, yeah, that's kind of it. That's how you read this graph, really, okay? The relationship between the half-life and the decay constant, Okay, here we go, T a half, ln over two, or ln two over lambda. Okay, so through experimentation, you have discovered that the decay constant and the half-life are interlinked. Now, you don't need to know that experiment, um, and more likely, unless you do specifically nuclear physics, you probably will never have to do that experiment, okay? Um, in your log, you can also, it's, I just summarize it over 0 0.693 over lambda because that's basically what LN2 kind of is, all right? So, bit of key, a key thing here for you, all right? So, math questions of radioactive decay are like comprehension questions. You need to read the question a couple of times, underline each relevant point, and remember there are only two formulas, okay? DNDT, okay, rate of decay. Oh, sorry, I meant it, actually. The rate of decay, where it's DNDT, where does that come from? If you go to your thing here, okay, your activity, this, the activity is also n, okay, and this is your time t. So if you remember back to um, calculus, change in your y axis, change in your x axis, dy dx, okay, well, here it's going to be dn, change in the number of atoms divided by dt. Okay, I'm just gonna write with my fingers. Okay, the ndt, that's where the dndt comes from, okay? So the ndt, the reason it's dndt is because the change in the number of, um, act, uh, the number of, um, nuclei, uh, divided by the change in the time, dn dt, okay? So if you remember back to calculus, guys, when you're getting the curve of a, of a line, that's where the dn dt comes from. We call it dy dx, okay? That's all. Now, the rate of decay, it can be called any of these five things. So remember these five things. They'll say the activity, the rate of decay, the number of particles emitted per second, the number of particles undergoing decay per second, the number of disintegrations per second. There are five different ways to ask for dn dt. Okay, and you need to know all of them because the end of question they will say the number of disintegrations per seconds were, or um, the, the number of particles that underwent decay per second were, and leave it at that. Okay, if you're nice, to, if they're nice, they might just tell you the activity, but these are the five different ways of saying the same thing. Okay, so you do need to know them. Um, solid state detector, yeah, look, 
not really much to say there. How does it detect radiation? The GM tube is probably the better one, okay? Now you can, I doubt, I doubt they'll ask for this one, okay? Okay, radioactivity. Most non-radioactive stabilized tubes can be made. So here we go. Now we're gonna come back to this in the next topic anyway. So we can make non-radioactive radioactive by barring bar them with neutrons, okay? These are uh, captured in the nuclei of the atoms, okay? And they eventually make the atoms unstable, okay? And cause them then to break down, releasing nuclear energy, okay? And of course, uses of radioisotopes, loads, okay? No two, you should be fine, okay? All right, and there's those two too. Problem six then, so we're getting into the maths then, okay? So, a radioactive isotope. So I know we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so we've got eight questions. And then we're on to atomic mass, and then one, two, three questions from that. All right, so it's, we're finally onto my stuff, the maths. All right, so the radioactive isotope has a half-life of five years. All right, what fraction of the isotope will remain after 20 years? And what fraction of the isotope will have decayed in 20 years? Okay, so there's just an easy way and a hard way to do these kind of questions. The hard way is you basically say, well, five years is the half-life, so 20 divided by five is four half-lives. So one equals a half, two is a half, times a half equals a quarter, three, a half times a half times a half, and eight, four, a sixteenth, okay? So one sixteenth remains, okay? That's fine for this, but what if there was 50 half-lives? Are you gonna go all the way down, continuously multiplying by two? So what trend did you see here that we can make this a little bit easier? Did you notice that each time we just increase that by two? So it'd be easier then. So half-life, one over two n. Okay. All right, so t half is one over two n. So all you do is you discover what the half-life of that is and sub it in for n, that's it, that's all you do. Sub it in for n and you're done, okay? So of course, that becomes one over two to the power of four, which gives us one sixteenth, okay? One remains, that's it, all right? The question did say as well, what fraction of original sample would have decayed? Well, if one sixteen remains, What's undecayed? Sorry, if 116 remains, what has decayed? 116 has 15 over 16 has decayed. There you go. All right. So the activity of a sample of radioactive isotope decreases to 132 of its original value after 250 years. What's its half-life? And I see this is why the previous question, we have this, one, one, over 2n equals 1 over 32. So we have to find out what 32 is, okay? So we cross multiply, 32 equals 2n. So we need, okay, we need to convert this 32 into a factor of two, okay? Because if the two factors are the same, we can get rid of them and we can find out what the squares are, okay? so. We know 2 to the power of 4 is 16, so 2 to the power of 5 will give us 32. Okay, so for maths, if they're the same, then that means the squares are the same, so 5 equals n. Okay, so therefore there's 5 half-lives. All right, so 250 years. Divide that by five gives us 50 year half-life. So it's got a 50 year half-life, okay? So 
There's a bit of maths there now. Um, I think that's in the log tables actually anyway. All right, so problem eight. The half-life of a certain isotope is 20 minutes. So we gotta convert that. Oh good, my tablet's doing that again. So I'm just gonna read the question, I'm gonna roll it up because I can't be dealing with this. How many half-lives are there in five hours? What fraction remains undecayed after three hours? What fraction is decayed after 40 minutes? And what fraction remains undecayed in N half lives? Okay, so time, we've got to convert that. So it's in 20 minutes. Well, yeah, convert it. Got to get used to converting it. You don't you get away with all converting it, but it's a bad habit to get into. T equals 20 times times 60. So the part one is number of half-lives. So in five hours, so the half-life is five hours. So therefore time, so five, 60 times 60 divided by 20 times 60 should give us 15 half-lives. Okay, so the time, so Five hours is going to pass. The half-life is 20 minutes. So just divide five hours by 20 minutes. Part two is what fraction remains undecayed. No, that's, yeah, undecayed after three hours. Okay, so that's the same thing. Three times 60 times 60. Three times 60 over 60 divided by 20 times 60 gives us nine half-lives. So one over two to the power of nine gives us one over 512 undecayed. So after nine half-lives, one over 512 of the original sample remains undecayed. Okay, so I'm gonna rub out the top bit now because I, I need the top bit to get the rest of the question. So part three, uh, what fraction has decayed in 40 minutes? Well, 40 minutes is simply gonna be two half-lives. So, because 20 minutes is a half-life, 40 minutes is two half-lives. So one over two to the power of two is a quarter, which means three quarters has decayed. And I'm gonna roll with the bottom bit here. Last one, what fraction remains undecayed after n half-lives? <laughs> Simply one over two, two n. Okay, there you go. All right. Um, problem nine, and then the last two, oh no, the last four, so there's, there's a lot of questions here guys, so bear with me, hopefully they're doing okay. The decay constant of a certain radioactive isotope, so the decay constant, that's lambda, so. So this, uh, slowly by time, this pain gets worse and worse. Lambda equals nine point six two seven by ten to the minus minus five. So drawing my finger is not as good. The numbers are too big. Uh, what fraction remains undecayed after six hours? So oops, so it's time. equals six, six time, times 60 times 60. Okay. And so the half-life, T, a half, equals L, LN2 over lambda, which should give us 72,000 seconds. And then we simply Divide 660 by 60 by 72,000, and we should end up with 
three. They said that I got check your maths there and make sure I didn't get that wrong. Okay, so therefore, one over two to the three equals one over an eight. So an eight is undecayed. All right. So what fraction remains undecayed? One eight. Uh, let's give me a little bit more space there. One eight undecayed. Okay. So lambda equals is the decay constant. It gave it to us. Time we convert to seconds. So the ln two, oh, half life is equal to ln two over lambda. Okay. So sub in your lambda value, and we get seven two seven thousand two hundred. Uh, and then, of course, you divide that into the total hours, which was, what do we say, six, and we get three. And so, therefore, how many half-lives? One over two to the power of a half. Or so how many undecayed? One over two to the power of a half. And that should do it. Okay? All right. So, problem 10. Oh. I hope you drank enough coffee before we started this. This is much longer than I thought it would take. Um, so, an alpha emitter. An alpha emitter has 2 by 10 to the 15 atoms on decay at a given constant. Okay. Uh, that's N. How many left? N. Well, uh, let's read the full question. If lambda equals 8 by 10 to the minus 3, find the C away. They give it to straight away. Find the activity. And what is activity? Okay. Well, activity equals lambda times n, okay? So n is 2 by 10 to the 15. Lambda was given to us as 8 by 10 to the minus 3. So the right arrow and left hand side. Fill these two values in up here. So our activity should end up being 1.6 by 10 to the 13 BQ. Okay? Right, uh, problem 11. The half-life of uranium-235, which is an alpha emitter, so half-life eight by, by 10 to the 18. Yeah, sometimes it works. And then sometimes it doesn't, All right? So eight by 10 to the 18, find a number of alpha particles. Oh, I gotta convert that to seconds. All right, okay, so. Years, bloody hell. So three, six, five times 24 hours in each day times 60 times. We are going to pretend leap years don't happen. So my time here is 2.528 There's two twos there. 288 8 by 10 to the 20 to the 26. Would that bloody 6 draw itself? Thank you. All right, so we have the time. Find the number of alpha particles emitted per second. There we go. What is the number of things emitted per second? What's that? That is the activity. Okay. Um, okay, so A, oops, A equals lambda times N. We have N, we don't have lambda. How do we find lambda? We have a half-life, T a half equals ln2 over lambda, which means lambda equals ln2 over the half-life. So our decay constant, when you sub that in, should be 2.747 by 10 to the minus 27 per second. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, da -da -da. Uh, we were given the n value. 6.2 by 10 to the 16. So now we sub those into our A value. So A is going to be 6.2 by 10 to the 16 times 2.747 by 10 to the minus 27. And our activity works out to be 1.7 
by 10 to the minus 10. That's my n value there. That's my lambda. N was given to a lamb, n was given to us up here, and that was lambda. In case people are wondering where they came from. And that's our answer there anyway. So the activity is 1.7 by 10 to the minus 10. That should be a 10, not a 6. That looks like a 16. 10 to the minus 10 alpha particles per second. Okay? All right. So problem 12. So this is an example question now. So this is 2007. And the one down on the leaf is 2005. So you probably haven't seen these. Uh, so the half-life of a radioactive element is three days. What fraction of the sample will remain after nine days? Well, nine divided by three will give us three. So one over two to the three equals one eight remains. So one eight remains. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's 2007, this is 2005. These dots are appearing everywhere, I don't know where they're from. Uh, so cobalt 60 is a radioactive isotope with a half-life of 5.26 years. Okay, so gotta convert that. So I got lazy here and I didn't bother, I just left it as um, two six by three six five by 24 by 60 by 60 okay so i just left it at that uh, i just couldn't have been arsed uh, working it out uh, so cobalt sorry calculate the decay constant of cobalt so what is the decay constant that is lambda so what equation do we have that's missing one value the half life t a half equals ln2 over lambda so lambda Oh my God, equals L, 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 N, two over the half-life. So when I sub in that value, I will get 4.18 by 10 to the minus 19. Okay, so that's part one. Part two then. I'm just trying to draw this on my finger now because that pen is that the new pen needs to hurry, hurry up and get here. Uh, so calculate the rate of decay um, of a sample of cobalt 60 when it has 2.5 by 10 to the 21 atoms. And that's fairly easy. So we'll calculate the rate of decay. That is simply our equation A equals lambda lambda times n. Okay, so we have lambda, we got in the previous question, previous part, and we have given, we were given n, uh, here it is, when it has 2.5 by 10 to, the, 10 to the 21 atoms. So simply then, the activity is 1.04 by 10 to the 13. BQ. There you go. Okay, so let's kind of practice with those kind of questions. Fairly self-explanatory, kind of a bit repetitive. They kind of happen to kind of do the same thing over and over and over. It's just read the question and what they're giving you, okay? So a lot of times people find it difficult to understand what the question is asking, okay? All right, so. So now we're going to look at the mole, okay? The mole of a substance, okay? The mole of any substance is the amount of that substance that contains as many particles as there are at this number. 6.02 by 10 to the 23, called Avgadro's number. Again, probably pronouncing that wrong. I've always pronounced it this way. So uh, if you have any problems with the way I pronounce it, leave a comment below and I will ignore it. Uh, so Avgadro's number. This means, all right, a mole of electrons is 6.02 by 10 to the 23. A mole, okay, of anything really is 6.02 by 10 to the 23, okay? It's the amount of that substance that contains as many particles as there are atoms, okay? So what you can do is you can actually find the number of atoms in any mass, okay, all right, that you're given, okay? So this question is usually kind of difficult, all right? So I have, let me see, one, two, three. I have three questions here to do with you, okay? Let's try and see if you can understand what we're getting at here, all right? 
So, problem one. The decay constant of uranium-235, which is an alpha emitter, is, so, the decay constant lambda equals 2.75 by 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Um, find the number of alpha particles emitted per second from a 1 kg sample. All right, okay. So, it's uranium-235. Okay, so that means two, three, two, three, five G's is one mole of U two three five. So therefore, two three five equals six point zero two by ten to the twenty. Three. Okay, so 6.02 by 10 to the 23 equals 235 grams of uranium. All right, so therefore 1 equals 6.02 by 10 to the 23 divided by 235. So 1 kg is simply a thousand of those. 6.02 by 10 to the 23 all over 235 times 1000. You see? That's all it is. All right, they'll tell you, um, like the next question, for example, it tells you straight up what uh, one mole of copper is. So they'll tell you, or else they kind of hinted it. So uranium 235, okay, is one mole, okay, so therefore 235 grams is one mole of uranium-235, so therefore 235 is equal to 6.02 by 10 to 23, what is one gram, and then multiply in your other value, okay? So therefore the number of atoms present, okay, so we're gonna have to, I'm gonna run out of space here, so we'll, we'll finish this question and I'll rub it all out, okay? So N is in one kg, so N in one kg, equals 2.56 by 10 to the 24 atoms, okay? So the number in one kg sample is 2.56 by 10 to the 24 atoms. this out because I need the space just for the last bit okay so the last part there is actually the question was um, find the number of alpha particles emitted per second so basically that's the activity so the activity a equals lambda times n we had lambda given to us in the question we just found n so your activity when you multiply those two together should be 7 by 10 to the seven alpha particles. Okay. So problem 15 then. How many atoms are there in two grams of copper? One mole of copper is 64 grams. Okay, so again, same thing again. 64 therefore is a mole. So 64 equals 6.02 by 10 to the 23, okay, which means 1 equals 6.02 by 10 to the 23 divided by 64, which means 2 kgs is 2,000 grams is that number times 2,000, which should be 1.88 by 10 to the 25 atoms. Okay. So 2 kgs gives us 1.88 by 10 to the 25 atoms. So that's all. The last question here then. A certain radioactive substance decays by alpha emissions when it's half-life, well, half of 22 hours. Okay, so this is going to be more similar to what an exam question could be. At a certain time, a sample of the substance is found to be emitting 150 alpha particles per second. 
So we have the activity. Oh, okay. So my tablet doesn't like that question. So we have the activity. So I'm not going to write it because I need the space, but usually you write your values on the left-hand side, but I'm a little caught for space here, so I can't really do that. So that is A, okay? And this is our one motor, all right? So we need to find the mass of the substance present, okay? So we're going to be working a little bit backwards this time. So we need to first off, what's the half-life? Or sorry, what are we looking for? So we know how much 288, 228 G, G equals one mole. Okay. So we need to find out, oh, okay, equals one mole. So in other words, 288 equals 6.02 by 10 to the 23. atoms okay so we need to find how many is in one atom so one atom we're going to divide across the other way equals 228 divided by 6.02 by 10 to the 23 okay so 6.02 by 10 to the 23 atoms present in 228 grams of this substance do we say what the substance is no all right now, what I need to find out is how many atoms are actually there. So we're trying to find N. That's what... Jesus, why does that keep jumping up? We're trying to find N, okay? So we know A equals lambda times N. N equals A over lambda. So we need to find lambda. How do we do that? Half-life equals LN... 2 over lambda, okay? So we rearrange that and we get lambda equals ln2 over our half-life, okay? And we told our time is in 22 hours, so you've got to convert that to seconds, so 22 times 60 times 60, and you should end up with your decay constant as 8. Why, why is that doing that? My God. Actually, do you know I'm gonna have to just rub that out. Okay, so I'm gonna move this up a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna have to move this up to here. All right. So anyway, that's our equation. What does lambda end up equaling? Lambda should equal 8.75 by 10 to the minus six. Okay, 8.75 by 10 to the minus 6. We sub that now in here. Okay, and, and what we get then, when we do that, we get an n value. n equals, what did I get for that? 1.714 by 10 to the seven atoms. Okay, so I got 1.714 by 10 to the seven atoms, okay? So I'm gonna have to rub out the bottom half here because I now need to sub that in up above. So we now have an N value, so we rub this out. So we've worked out our N value through a process of elimination. Oops. So we now need to find So we now need to find, uh, where are we, 1.714 by 10 to the 7 is equal to 228 over 6.02 by 10 to the 23 times 1.714 by 10 to the 7. So we should end up with one point. 1.714 by 10 to the 7 equals 6.5 by 10 to the minus 15 grams. So that was needlessly long and complicated, okay? So a certain radioactive substance decays by alpha emissions with a half of 22 hours. 
Okay? At a certain time, a sample of the substance is found to be emitting 150 alpha particles per second. And if one mole of the substance is a mass of 2 to 8 grams, calculate the, calculate the mass. So the first thing we need to do is 2 to 8 grams equals 1 mole, which means 2 to 8 grams equals 6.02 by 10 to 23 atoms. So 1 atom is 2 to 8 divided by that. Okay? So we need to find the mass of the substance present. In other words, we need to find how many atoms are there. So that's why we first have to find a equals lambda times n. So n equals a over lambda. So we have a, but we needed lambda. So how do we find lambda? The half-life, you find that, you sub that in, you sub that in, and then you bring it back, sub it in again. Okay. That is the end of topic 29, uh, the atom. Okay. So I know I got very, very math heavy near the end there, um, but it was very, very theory heavy at the start. Uh, generally, practice those questions a few times and you'll find that it's the same. It tends to be the same thing over and over and over. All that gets people really is the, the question, is the way they're phrased, okay? Uh, with pretty much every physics question, practice makes, practice makes perfect, okay? Going back over answering questions is kind of the best way to get good at it, okay?